Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galo, making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale galu, we know say you drop the money from, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Thank you very much for coming. This is um, the panel discussion on dealing with post COVID mental health crisis in Africa, the African response. And my name is Maria Maliko Mohammed, and with me is Dr. Leila Hussain, is Howard Ojefo, and um, Dr. William Ebiti. And together we're going to talk about, you know, what COVID has done to Africa, what our response is, and hopefully, you know, have solutions to what our mental health crisis is, you know, what our mental health crisis response, crisis response would be. So um, I'm going to just do a little a bit of introduction for everyone. Um, I have Dr. APT, I, or perhaps I'll just allow you to just introduce yourselves as well. It's just throwing me up a bit. Um, I'd also like to say that Leila the same will be leaving us in about 40 minutes, so we'll try as much as possible to get her input and also get what she has to what what she has to give to us as quickly as possible. So please, Dr. Leila, can you introduce yourself a bit and tell me what is your take on our post-COVID response in Africa? What are the important things that we need to know? No, um, I'm Dr. Leila Hussain. I'm a psychotherapist by practice. I'm the founder of the Dahlia Project, which is a service work with FGM survivors and the, the co-founder of Safe Space for Black Women. Um, I mean, really, I think what we have to remember, uh, it's one, we were forced into a lockdown. So that already can cause a lot of trauma. And for many, what they've been experiencing, it's flashbacks. So the idea of being told you cannot move has its own uh, uh, issues. Uh, many who have who already had been experiencing other mental health issues have also now reliving, and it's actually intensified even more. You know, we are even more angrier than we've ever been. We are restless, no one's sleeping. You know, some people are actually just going into a sleeping coma where they're not waking up, so it could be the total opposite. You know, we are comfy eating or not eating. You know, we are irritable because a lot of people are actually stuck with their families, so they've been forced to be with people who are not necessarily people that they get on well with. So it's not hasn't been a lovely time for everybody. Like a lot of people have been posting it on social media. It's been really difficult uh, for a lot of people. In terms of in the African context, what, the bit what really worried me one, I started running emotional wellbeing calls for activists, frontline activists in Africa, um, to really support, to give a safe space. For me, for me, creating safe spaces are extremely important. So for me, it was extremely important that we created, we, got, we came together and we talked about our feelings on how we're feeling. What, what, I, what struck me quite early on in these calls, there was a fear of even admitting that we were suffering. So there's a taboo around the word mental health. Even I use the word well-being, you know, the idea of saying I'm not feeling well, I'm not feeling that great or I feel down. And I mean, we've been running these schools since March. I mean, now the conversation has definitely shifted where people are naming their feelings. I think the more we practice, the better. But what's really interesting in Africa, we very much glamorize being strong and resilient and, you know, tough. That's being glamorized, you know, that's, that's seen as a positive thing. So the idea of being vulnerable is something that we really, really had to unpack in these uh, calls that we've been running. So the idea, and I could see the shift that was happening from March to by the time we got to May, people were actually naming. But the struggle has been that we are still scared there's shame and mental health is very much connected to exorcism, you know, to the, uh, the devil possessed you. So there's a really negative connotation to mental health uh, 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 issues during, especially, and the lockdown, what it's done, it's just made that even worse for everybody. But just one more point, I think also that needs to be addressed. Africa, we are, you know, Africa, all of us are dealing with generational trauma and something like this re-triggered all of that. When I say generational trauma, I mean, we have not acknowledged what happened to us during slavery during colonization. So that trauma, we still have not created a space where we can actually talk about what happened to us. Because you know why, as Africans, we are on survival mode the whole time. We are surviving. No one's actually living. But in order to live, you need to actually name 
and acknowledge what's happened to all of us. So, but generational trauma is something that's passed on over and over and over again. Even someone who didn't have depression, who is dealing with the crisis of COVID, they are experiencing something that we call secondary trauma. So you might not have experienced their trauma, but just hearing their stories, and I'm sure a lot of you would agree that when you're hearing people's other negative stories, it has an impact on you. So you have to deal with it. So in, in this course, you know, we would teach people how to take care of yourself, you know, go to nature, you know, stay away from your phones, you know, just basic stuff. But the main message on every call was we must be very kind to ourselves. You know, it's so important because these are really tough times. We have been forced to do something that is unnatural. You cannot lock down human beings. We are not made in that way. So, 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 the, the, and the crisis will continue, by the way. My fear is more people are going to die from mental health issues than they are from COVID. That is really what I'm worried about. Thank you very much, Leila. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that I picked from there was choice. You know, the fact that you have been denied, you know, choice to choose whether you go out or not go out and someone else so it has its own connotations as well as well as you know vulnerability and being exposed to something that you don't even know how to name so thank you very much for that um i'm going to talk to her one hour about her own experience with you know covid you know mental health um covid the crisis and what we're doing about it so, uh, and then... <laughs> thank you very much Maria. <laughs> uh, so yes, um, I'm Hawa Ojoifo and I am the founder and executive director of She Writes Women. I publicly identify as a person who lives with a mental health condition and social disability. Um, and I think it's important for me to mention because of the kind of community that I, that you know, we at She Writes Women, you know, we interface with. So we're a community of people who, um, we say we're a women-led movement of um, people who live with mental health conditions. Um, we're giving mental health the voice in Nigeria by empowering we the people who actually live with mental health conditions to co-create our solutions, to tell our own stories and to advocate for, that, for our own rights. And it's interesting because Leila said a lot about safe spaces and we actually had like our flagship program is called Safe Place, um, Safe Place um, Nigeria. And we have been running this in 2016 and it's a monthly support group that we've had every single month. So we've had it in Lagos, Abuja, Kaduna, and um, Ibado as well. And we have been able to reach about 900 beneficiaries, women and girls, um, in you know creating that safe space, creating a place for accountability and vulnerability for women and girls who are going through other mental health challenges or generally are looking for places where they feel accepted and included. Um, so definitely when COVID-19 hit, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting the things that happen because on the one hand, we are dealing with, you know, a group of people who are pre-existing mental health conditions or high cost disabilities. On the other hand, we're dealing with, you know, the rest of the population that either are only built on diagnosed or just have an everyday mental health issue. And it's interesting because I think Laila has hit the point, like one of the major points that I've, I've tried to, to make throughout the pandemic. And, you know, I've had to go on calls with organizations and, you know, other events to tell people like we're not on vacation guys like this is not a vacation whether we like it or not this is a collective trauma and we need to realize that very early because what that does is that it helps us to reframe how we look at the pandemic you know so when you're home what is really happening and i saw it a lot in the in the people that you know interface with our organization whether through our helpline our support groups or you know other sort of like support services and psychosocial support services what we realize is that you know people are you know like you said have a lot of time on their hands but they can't be productive you know they're not exhausted in anything you know outside so they should be able to sleep well right but you're not so you know it's us trying to help people to reframe the fact that look your body's going through and it's taking in a lot of stress you're you're seeing a lot of like overwhelming news and negative news oh it's a black lives matter oh somebody's dead oh somebody was shot or oh, somebody's this and somebody died and somebody has COVID. and it's like you know the thing is your bit of control i think we underestimate how powerful control is in our lives as human beings you know the ability to plan and control and have a semblance of you know pinning it like i can put a pin on it you know but this is is this was completely different is that you don't know when it's ending you don't know how it's going to work you don't know how you know all of those external things are taken away from you and so it's you in this environment where your body's processing stress and so a lot of people we saw trauma responses and you know just to put it very simply it's like you know fight flight and freeze 
for some people, they felt they need to like do a lot from their homes and work hard and, you know, do all of those things. For some people, it was, I was good. I mean, I feel like this is the leave I've been asking for. And then here I am at home and now I'm not productive or now I'm eating a little too much or not eating at all, or I'm forgetting to eat or I'm not sleeping well. You know, all of these things, you know, everyone is, everyone is nodding. <laughs> Because these are our realities, right? And Absolutely. it was just so interesting. But we, we failed to realize that, you know, our mental health was in was in question. And we were processing a lot more beneath the surface that we needed to know. So when we talk about our helpline, we saw about 80% more increase in calls that, we ha- that had to do with anxiety. And anxiety from a couple of things. We saw a lot of relationship-induced anxiety. People at home with your significant others and having, like, a lot of stresses things that you'd ideally, you know, go out to work and, you know, manage the time apart, which helps in any kind of relationship. And now we saw like people are hitting, you know, each other's heads and running into each other, you know, in their own spaces. And that was causing a lot of issues for a lot of people. We saw in terms of gender-based violence, intimate partner violence in particular, people who are locked at home with, you know, partners or even parents who, you know, abuse them or violent to them, whether sexually or otherwise. And we saw a lot of calls with regards to that and we were able to respond to that. I think one of the things that was so interesting was creating a support group, a virtual support group for people to come in together. And it's so powerful. I mean, we've been doing this since 2016, but every single month and every single edition, we see that power play out before us. People, you know, just the power of hearing your story being echoed back to you. It is something that, you know, and, you know, like Leila said, it's the representation. But I think in my own community, it's slightly different from how they look at it. You know, for us, it is, I as a person who lives with a mental health condition, talking to other people who have mental health conditions in a society that tells us not to talk about You know, so it's so powerful because they're like, oh, wow, you talk about it so easily. That gives me a lot of confidence. And that sort of like helps me realize that my experience is valid. And, you know, my story is valued as well. So we saw all of that going on. But I think it's so important just to highlight the power of realizing that whilst we're all like dealing with mental health conditions or, you know, mental health stressors due to COVID, it's not affecting all of us equally. I tell people a lot of times that we cannot talk about mental health without talking about social issues generally, especially poverty. And that is something that we need to really, really begin to understand, especially on this side of the world, mm-hmm. like in Nigeria, where, you know, the, the socioeconomic outcomes of a people or the socioeconomic status of a people can grossly affect their mental health outcomes. And that is what we saw as well during the pandemic. I mean, prior to the pandemic, we've seen it or we knew it, but I think the pandemic sort of like reinforced it for us because now you have the most vulnerable population being caught up because they don't have access to you know, these virtual spaces that were created. And, you know, that begins to bring questions of internet rights and where is everybody? Who is the furthest behind? How do we include them? So as an organization, we have to start responding by going to meet them, to give them core credits and internet so that they could be invited onto all of these platforms so that the furthest behind and the most vulnerable are not actually left out of the situation. So, yeah, I think uh, it was it was quite a, a rich experience for us in terms of challenges and our Thank you very much, Harold. I, I, I think that, you know, this time really, really was something. People that couldn't join up to support groups or even couldn't talk about things that they could, the internet just provided that. So now if you have a phone, you have access to the world and you could be included in so many different things. And I found that a lot of women specifically were empowered by that. The fact that, you know, you can just put on your phone, go to a little space and talk to someone in a way that perhaps before you wouldn't have physically done so um really really brilliant you know things happening right now with covid sometimes i look at it and i think it's the gift of time and it's the gift of many many things that we have gotten but at the same time with these gifts as well it's almost like they're imperfections obviously that we have to, to look at so i'll talk to bill now about what he has you know noticed with you know um, the covid crisis but more about you know people you've mentioned something about socioeconomic you know um, factors or stresses that contribute to mental health illness but do people even know that they have mental health challenges like you said so someone like you and like also Leila had mentioned earlier that someone like me talking to someone else that has mental health issues people are going it's more it's liberating it's freeing 
I know can, but do people actually realize how you know they do have mental illness? Do they realize that mental health is an issue? Because it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to know that you know this is something that would be going on with you. So Bill, could you sort of talk to us about that as well? All right. For the most part, I, I would say that most persons with mental um, health challenges do not even know that they have any mental health issues. Um, it takes an average of um, six months to about three years before people present for the very first time when they have mental health challenges. We, we must recognize the fact that for, for a couple of people who even recognize that there are unusual things that they are feeling, they may rather deny it and delay it. And in many cases, they would want to maybe give alternative explanations within the cultural and religious setting for the problems that they're having before they present. And for some mental illnesses, they present in very complex manners that people may not know that these are mental illnesses. A typical example is depression in the blacks. And Caucasians may simply just have issues with their sleep and maybe possibly the issue of appetite, there is low mood, they're not feeling happy and the worst. But for some blacks, they could carry on as if everything is okay, but they'll be complaining about peppery sensation in the body. They have this heaviness in the head. There is crawling sensation in their body and all that. And these are manifestations. These may be manifestations of mental illness, but they do not know. And therefore they cannot seek help you know, for mental health problems. So they will likely go to a primary health care center, hospitals where they see other specialists with these complaints. And these specialists are likely going to make diagnoses ranging from malaria to other kinds of illnesses. They are given medication and it actually never goes away. In fact, the lady that I saw today, you know, that I spoke with her on phone, because the brother is worried that each time he speaks with the sister, he will call the sister, the sister may not pick his phone for a couple of weeks, and then she will finally pick the phone, and that, she, that he feels that there's something wrong with the sister, that can I please speak with her? And I said, okay, could you call her and link me up? And then he called her and linked me up, and then I had a discussion with her, only to find out that this lady has been thinking of killing herself in the last eight months. You know, she's been having this sensation in her ears and all that. There is no support system around her. It's so much overwhelming. Of course, she's not gone to work because of the lockdown. And even when the lockdown had been lifted, she's not also gone to work till now. She locks herself up in the house. She's not been eating. She's not talking to anybody. And um, I asked her today the first time that, you know, the last time that she went out. And this woman has not been out of her house in the last one week. And that's really serious. But nobody knows that she has a problem of this nature. So that's, so that's also a key thing. Now, moving from even recognizing that there is a problem, if you go to the hospital in most cases, you'll be expecting the doctors to tell you what the problem is. But if you go to a primary health care center where there is no capacity to make those kinds of diagnoses and all that, so they don't really know what is happening to you. So available uh, you know, resources and available places for care do not really exist and, or are not really prevalent. And even when they're available, the accessibility to is a problem you know because you may not be able to access them they're really far in between and um you know you mentioned you know sometime here about the fact that there are just about 200 psychiatrists in a country with about 200 million people so you can just imagine you know the amount of uh, people that cannot have access to the people that need to care for them and of course with the ideas of denial and all that that we see in people who may even have mental illnesses because we would always look for alternative explanations to these problems it makes it easier for you to feel that there's a problem than a mental health problem because remember the issue of stigma and discrimination for people that have mental health problems makes it difficult for people who are even diagnosed to have mental problems to want to seek help and care for this problem. And for the COVID-19 era, we also see an upsurge of the use of psychoactive substances. And in many cases, people were using it to medicate the symptoms of mental illness. Mm -hmm. that they were and for others, they were using it to cope with the trauma and the problems associated with job losses, the problem of being at home and the fear of not having what to do. So these are some of the things that we're seeing and the difficulties 
that the COVID-19 era has uh, thrown up to us in terms of medical personnel having the capacity to deal with people with mental health issues. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Pitti. I'd like um, to talk to Leila now about, you know, do you think that this COVID-19 crisis has made us better off about, you know, the conversations around mental health, um, conversations around um, violence? Have we become slightly better or are we seeing just the fact that now people sort of, the ones making noise, the ones that are activists in it are amplifying their voices or is it general improvement you get in in mental health issues I, I think what this virus has done is forced us to talk about it we had no choice we literally had no choice now and i think one that's absolutely a positive thing but it shouldn't have come to that i think you know we talk about you know breast cancer you know we talk about aids we talk about all these other medical physical condition but somehow we still are scared and i would like and, and i think this is why it's so important you know, platforms like Ake, and I would like to encourage many other platforms, absolutely create space, more spaces to talk about emotional well-being. I think that's the term I like to use personally. I think that's what we are looking for. We want to be, you know, we're have, we want to be in a space where we have well-being. If we physically, it's acceptable to check myself physically, I should check myself emotionally and psychologically. And I think we need to start creating more spaces to talk about this. That's how you get rid of taboo. Uh, uh, you know, if, if, you feel, if anything's taboo, it's connected to shame. How do you get rid of shame? We have to talk about it. We have to talk about it. So what this virus has done, it's enhanced the conversation around mental health. We were forced into it. But specifically, what, what really shocks me till now, really shocks me till now, a virus has made the world stop. But when women are being violated, there is no outrage. It doesn't make the world stop. When people are committing suicide, it doesn't make the world stop. And that's what we really need to reflect on. What kind of human beings have we become when we have a reaction to a virus? I'm not saying this, you know, this virus isn't dangerous. And I work with women who've undergone female genital mutilation. Every 11 seconds, a girl will be mutilated globally. But there's no outrage. The world doesn't stop. That really says about a lot about our psyche. So I'm really glad we're finally having this conversation. And I would like to encourage Ake to continue creating a platform to talk about mental health because we need to remove the taboo. We need to remove the shame around this because, like, I, you know, I am someone who suffers from depression and my mental health was definitely compromised. I remember the first three weeks I didn't get out of bed. That was the reality. It really affects you. So it's important that we continue to, to have these discussions, not just on festivals. It has to be every space. I would like to encourage everybody watching this conversation ask someone next to you do you have you have you have, are you okay have you been feeling okay emotionally and you will find all of us it'll be strange if none of us had any form of mental health issue just look at the world around us people are dying there's wars we're dealing with racism we're dealing with misogyny we're dealing with patriarchy it'll be strange if we didn't have any form of mental health issue so we have to normalize the conversation Oh, um, I think that, you know, in normalizing the conversation as well, we have to sort of take it out. And yeah, voices like Ake and, um, you know, people watching and so on. But I think even a greater responsibility, I think we've talked about this offline with um, Bill, about, you know, he says that there must be awareness of this. And he's, he's, he's sort of thought that, you know, charging the government with it, you know, and we know that our governments do what they do. <laughs> Can I, can I just add a point? Can I just add a point? I absolutely agree because imagine, just imagine for a second, as children, you know, primary school kids, we were taught about uh, uh, about our, our basic human rights. We were taught about finances because you know we need to learn how. I, I'm still scared to look at my bank statement. I don't know how that works. It's like yeah. still a scary thing. If we're taught, if we're taught about healthy relationships, mm -hmm. and if we were taught about well-being, what kind of human beings would we be today? It's absolutely important to politicians. We need to look at education system. Our education system has not served us. I'm telling you, Africa, we've got enough doctors, we've got enough lawyers, we've got enough engineers. We need psychotherapists now. We need people working in mental health. We need to go into that environment. And our schools need to teach children about well-being very early on. So as a psychotherapist now, so I'll just do a quick question. You know, how, you know, what is your practice like? You know, um, 
where you are do, do africans plug in you know do you still have problems convincing people because i i i have a competence in coaching and sometimes when people have issues and counseling as well and they ask them to come and speak to me 90 percent of them would not 90 percent of them would do it because someone says to do it but after that is in or how all my secrets are looking like that in and all our family problems is going to be out there and then of course it doesn't also help that the professionals will discuss these things as well you know and say oh i know them they have you know in that you know how, 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 how do we help people to come to us i i think for me again i go back to that word safe space my job is to create the safe space but i also have to be patient in that safe space if one person comes into that room because we run groups but we also do one-to-ones mm -hmm. one-to-ones mm -hmm. when a, when a client doesn't turn up it doesn't mean they're a terrible person there's fear there's a real fear for people wanting to face what's going on with them mentally. There's a real fear. So we have to be extremely patient. So one of the things we started doing in my clinic now, before anyone goes into any form of therapy, we run three-day workshops to get them to understand how a mental health service actually works. What, what, what is mental health? How does it work? Why will you benefit from it? So they get a little bit of an education around what mental health is, but also there's still a real fit. So my job as a therapist is to educate and also create a safe space, then slowly, slowly people come in. You know, we went, I remember my first ever first group, I had two people, but I now run groups of 15 people. One of our first Zoom calls with the Black Women Safe Space, 75 women logged in. So it's managed, so it, it does, the more the more we talk about this, the more we create safe spaces, the more people are gonna come. And, the more, and that makes it much more normal. We have to normalize this. We have to talk about it everywhere we go. Thank you, Lena. I think it's really important. This normalizing it's lifting, it's lifting the shame. My job yeah. is to lift the shame from that space I'm creating. Exactly. And um, yeah. I hope all of us are able to do it for one person or many, many people. Um, yeah. I, was, I, I would, you know, um, like how we talk more about trauma. She talked about trauma. And I remember the first few days of COVID-19, it was like, we're going to die tomorrow. Somebody was going to give you an infection and you're going to die. And so I think we've had to deal with our mortality for every day living with the fear that, you know, this is going to be over and this is highly traumatic for anyone. You couldn't even go to the hospital if you were ill with other things. So that was, um, you know, um, a lot of problems, you know, that you know, we had to surmount. I would like her to talk more. She said so many things about you know, vulnerability, framing it, inclusion. I'd like to hear more about her work. I think that map, so that, you know, those of us that have to jump off would actually you know, leave the rest of us that are not here. So how well, please, could you? I think the, the pandemic was really, it was a very interesting thing because I think, um, it's interesting because all of these other issues that we're talking about now, mental health, the trauma, you know, sexual violence, and all of those things are things that have been happening, you know, prior to the pandemic. But for some reason, now it's taking a pandemic for everyone to now begin to look at it like, oh my gosh, something is really going on here. Or this thing is a real issue. Oh my gosh, I didn't even know that that was what I was going through. And sometimes you don't even know that that's what it is until, you know, you're interfacing with other people who have similar experiences. And then somebody says, oh my gosh, that's actually what you're going through. And we saw that time and time again, you know, with our contact with the community and, you know, our beneficiaries as well. It was like we've said, it's the basic things, you know, because the thing is, and it's something I try to talk about a lot of times, is that when we think about mental health, we all of a sudden just jump and we somewhat interpret it as mental illness. You know, we just yeah. go to the extreme. And we, we, what that does is that it always creates a divide. It always, you know, causes it to be those people versus us. So it's like, oh, we're fine. It's not us. It's those people. And then, you know, it's it's it causes more and more divide in, you know, or it causes us to lean less in to less into mental health conversations. Because the thing about mental health, of course, that we know is that it affects us all. It is our mental health, just like we have physical health, right? But then what happens a lot of times is that, you know, we just automatically think that if you have a mental health issue, that it's some extreme, you know, psychosis or something like that. So I think first off, it was about us really like dialing back to be able to say, look, it's in your sleep, it's the way you eat, it's the way you show up, it's how you're feeling, you know? And when we had more of those conversations throughout the pandemic, it's like, oh, really? Are you trying to say that? Oh, wow. For some reason, I don't know why that has been happening. And this was like, oh yeah, me too. Like, oh really? So you mean that's about my mental health? Like, exactly, that is about your mental health. You know, because, and of course you mentioned, you mentioned, you mentioned the shame there and um, also the fear, the fear that we're living with 
every single day, which is so interesting because we had a lot of people, you know, just not a lot of people just fearing for themselves, but fearing for their loved ones. A lot of people were so scared about their parents, you know, when you get news that, oh my gosh, there's vulnerable population and things, and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't go and see them. And then you have people who were locked up, locked down away from their loved ones. I, I spent the entire, like, till they lifted the lockdown, I was by myself in Abuja for like five months by myself. And I didn't interface with any human being for about three months. And then I remember, of course, having a pre-existing mental health condition myself. My, my family were very, very like, oh my gosh, what is going on? How are you? I'm like, I'm not even going to lie to you. I've been talking to myself. Like, there's nobody here, so we're going to have to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and while this was really funny for a lot of people, of course it is kind of funny, it's a reality. You know, it's, it's one of the ways that we saw people have an outlet. And of course, we talked about people now, you know, looking at alcohol and substances during the period, anything to cope and stay afloat. For me, it was just, I'm just going to talk because I'm not killing anybody. I don't know how I'm harming anybody. So I may as well just talk to myself, you know. And it was interesting. We had people who, like, they have, like, this gas and breathalyzers and everything. Like, the fear was something. Like, somebody's going out and she has, like, three gloves on. I'm like, yo, you're not even like a frontline worker. Like, take it easy. But the thing is, it was really scary to receive that much bad news condensed like that in your face every day. You open your social media, it's there. You open your WhatsApp stories, it's there. And every day they're telling us the death talks. And I'm like, look, guys, we don't need to know how many people die on a daily basis. Yes, the media and the NCDCs and all of that, CDCs need to do it you know, as a, as, a, as a form of public accountability. But we don't need to feed ourselves that information every day because it's really not doing us any good, you know? So somebody's like, oh my God, we're past 50,000, and they didn't die. And I'm like, yes, I know it's really terrible, but the truth is that the only control we have, and that's what this pandemic is also trying to tell us, is that we need to try and focus on our area of control. Where do you have control over? Because a lot of stress really comes from when we're trying to reach beyond the things that we can control. You know, so you're trying to like save the world or you're in Nigeria, but then Black Lives Matter. And then you're and it's like, oh, my gosh, you get overwhelmed. And it's like, OK, let's breathe. Let's step back. What's around your environment? Do you have to eat? Let's start with that. Can you sleep? OK, let's let's go with that. Can you work? You have a source of sustenance. Let's go back to the basics and let's control that, you know. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because it was everything. That's the truth. COVID-19 affected everything. Um, well, let me just interrupt you a bit here because I know you need to leave as well, but I think um, Leila needs to leave in the next five minutes. So I would like her to sort of give us, you know, I hope, are you leaving in the next five minutes as well? Yeah. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. Um, Bill, just forgive me a bit. I know we'll have a lot more time to converse because you're not going anywhere, hopefully. So um, I want to, I want Leila to leave us with a parting message, if you like, you know, what can I do as an individual, you know, post-COVID, mm. to be able to lift, you know, my Africa out of this? <laughs> what am I going to do? I mean, I think Africa, we need to remember that we are actually in this together. We are, the suffering is real and it's happening to all of us in different stages. So we need to accept that. But we have to be hopeful. Do you know what's, you know what's so beautiful about our continent? We might not call it mental health, but we actually used to deal with conflict. You know, mental health is conflict within your mind. We need to go back to some of those practices. You know, I remember in Somalia when there was a conflict, you sat under the tree in a circle drinking tea and people talked about their problems that was something that we did traditionally so mm -hmm. it wasn't it's not something new to us in terms of how we deal with mental health issues we just didn't call it that so really let's start looking back on how we actually as africans you know we had these practices on how we coped um but also for me what's really important is i can sit here and say to you please eat well exercise make sure you have productive you know daily routine but you know what that doesn't work for everybody you know, I, I still struggle when I wake up in the morning. I have all these amazing, great plans the night before. And then when I wake up, it's like, you know what? Forget it. I just want to eat a chocolate bar and sit yeah. in my couch. And you know what? That's okay. That, that's the whole point with mental health. You have to be super kind, especially when you're struggling. Be super kind to yourself. I would say make sure you have at least one or two people you can call and to say, hey, I'm struggling a little bit. You know, that could be part of your care plan. But one thing I personally have done and it was something that I needed. I needed black women to have specifics, but I think we really are suffering the most uh, with this virus, with everything, because black women are dealing with patriarchy and racism. 
you know, we two big issues around the world, and that is connected to violence, yeah, oppression, you know, controlling the female body and sexuality. So for me, creating that space, the reason I actually have to log out early is because I run that session uh, today. So those are the days I actually run this session. But I, I love it. And it's and for me, it's been helpful for me personally because I get to log in on a Zoom call with all black women's faces. I don't get to experience that. I live in London. A lot of the Zoom calls I log into, I'm usually the only black person, <laughs> not just woman, the only black person. So I bet, so start creating your own safe spaces, what it means hanging with people that you enjoy you know, if you're reading books together, you know, do something joyful and fun. Africa, we need to have more joy, but also we need to be more vulnerable. Show our vulnerability. It's the most strongest uh, characteristic we can show, and it's how we're going to start healing. We need we will deal with those generational uh, traumas, but really seek these spaces. If you're a black woman, we actually have a space for you. It's free. You just need to register. If you go on my Instagram page or my Twitter page, you'll see the form register we'll send you a zoom link we run it three times a week we have different therapists from different african you know black different black women are running these these spaces please join we need these spaces we can create some more in other parts of the world but we're in virtual now so we can we can connect i think that's the best thing that's come out of this we can all connect in one space so there is hope i don't want people to feel that there isn't hope but let's just continue to have this conversation and encouraging platforms like Ake to carry on continuing these conversations and creating a platform for us mental health workers to continue speaking. Bill, so Bill, I'd like your opinion on all of this wonderful things that these ladies have been talking about. All right. Um, there are certain things that is really of interest to me that I feel that we should, um, you know, possibly take a look at. Um, one of the questions that we should be asking is, why is an average African, why would they not readily seek some form of help and psychosocial support. Remember that the way we Africans view medicine or view illness is um, a little bit quite different. We would expect to go to see a doctor in an office who would look at us, examine us, and give us drugs for us to go and take medication. But you are asking someone to walk into someone else's office. You spend about 30 minutes and they're just asking you questions and talking seemingly about general things, about your life, about your reactions to those kind of things, about your feelings and what generate the feelings, what are some of the thought processes that you are having in mind and what generate those thought processes and all that. So people find it very difficult to relate that to a kind of service per se. And so as a result of that, you know, many of them just think that it's just a matter of just going to talk to someone. It's beyond talking to someone. It's therapy in itself, but they don't quite recognize that. Now, Leila said something that was very, you know, um, um, important, and which is, as African, we had a way of dealing with things. This communal kind of life where you talk to people, relatives are always sitting down together. We have meals together in the evening, and we use that to talk about a lot of tales. We resolve issues of each other. We assist each other to deal with their challenges and all that. That's how we used to be as Africans. But a lot of that had been replaced with social media and all that, and where we would have like a million friends and there's none of them that actually really knows your middle name or knows what kind of food you like to eat or knows anything about you. But it's fine that you have a million friends, you know, that's on social media. So we've replaced that kind of bonding, you know, shoulder to shoulder kind of relationship where we talk about deep seated things with each other with just this fabulous life of, you know, so that in itself creates a problem. And so we may have to identify that as one of the problems that we are having as Africans in terms of being able to relate with each other and deal with some of these issues that we have. But I think that when Africans begin to understand the fact that talking to each other from that point of view, having someone that you can confide in when you have a problem immensely makes a whole lot of difference in terms of the way we deal with those issues. And in many cases, why a, a safe space becomes very important, you know, and that's what our is doing, which I would say is a very great thing to do because I'm helping people create safe spaces. We're doing that in the IDP camps now for the women that are there. Yeah. Is that when people share their experiences and share their strengths and they assist each other, 
it goes a long way to help them cope with the problems that they are facing. Because oftentimes when we feel that we're alone in the world facing this problem, which we often do feel when we have issues, it is so overwhelming to us. But when we know that there are other people that are sharing our feelings, our thoughts, our problems, and they are ready to hear us out, they are not going to be judgmental because they understand what we are going through and that they are going to understand what we are going through and that they are ready to be of assistance to us. It goes a long way to helping us cope and it helps us build resilience, which is one of the things that support groups actually does and those safe spaces. And so, you know, having more of those kind of safe spaces and getting people to work together, it's something that, in my own opinion, I feel that really helps people who have mental health challenges in dealing with some of these, uh, you know, the symptoms that they are facing. Wow, um, I think um, you've hit the nail in the in, in the right place because Africans we just don't like to be vulnerable. We don't like to talk about you know our more you know um, intimate issues. And I think the reason why is that it's not easy to talk about your feelings because you know more often than not people judge it. And even if they have the same feelings, they can't be seen to have those feelings. So they'll judge you while secretly thinking, okay, and you find that they're in a worse place. I think also the bend on social media. The thing is, I look at it, having, having run safe places for the better part of four years, I find that, you know, it's like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. So the more you're able to express, the easier it gets to express. So I will have people within my community say, oh my gosh, like, how do you talk about such sensitive issues so easily? And I'm like, well, on the one hand, I've been talking about it for four years. And I talk about my story and I talk about the environment and I talk about, and I talk about every single time. And I'm like, it wasn't as easy four years ago, but it gets easier every single day. So what I tell people is, first of all, when we're creating safe spaces, please bear those two things in mind, vulnerability and shame. I mean, of course, there are other things like, you know, diversity, having a diverse group of people, ensuring that there is inclusion, because it's one thing to tell people come into a group. It's another thing to say, you know, you have a place in, in the, at the table. And then the last thing is belonging. You know, belonging is a lot more than just inclusion. It's being able to say, I am respected, I am fully seen in this present moment, right here, right now, in this space. And that is something that is so important when we're trying to create spaces for people to express themselves. But if we look at the Nigerian environment, for example, that's not our reality. First off, you know, here getting people to talk, a lot of times what happens is that it exposes us to the issues we have to deal with in ourselves. So the truth is when we run away, from those are uh, those personal issues we don't want to hear it echoed back to us so we shut it down when it comes so if somebody says how are you i remember telling somebody somebody was asking me how are you and i'm like hmm, man uh, and was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. just say i'm fine just say i'm fine and let's move on i am like oh wow that's interesting because i was really hoping that when the person asked how are you they really wanted to find out how it was and i wasn't yeah. fine you know, but, but but I, that I, I, want, I want to say something that I've realized now, you know, in the way of speaking in Nigeria, you know. I say, you know, I, last week I had a call with someone and I said, oh, I didn't hear from you for so long. And the person said to me, oh, I've been really strong. I, I'm so well. You know? And I was like, it took me all of a few seconds to realize that that person was saying they were not feeling well. So we've got this whole culture of affirmations now that, you know, they're opposite to what really we should be saying because people now affirm something then we become it. I think we've missed this whole idea of what affirmations really are. And I'll pick up what um, Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, what Bill said about you know social media. You know, I, I always tell my children and their teenagers now, you know, if I say, oh, you look really handsome today, they won't believe me till they put a picture on Snapchat and somebody likes it, yeah? So I said, this is someone that means nothing to you. And I said, hey, nice one, you know, you look nice. And that is more important than me that loves you totally and, you know, will possibly tell you the truth. So the, the system that we have also on affirmations in Nigeria or in Africa at large, I don't know if it's in, with other Africans as well, I really don't know. But I know that in Nigeria, I'm well, I am strong, I am this. You know, I know you like the things but it also deflects and it, it's it doesn't really help with your mental wellness i think you absolutely know, I, I how, yes Dr. you wanted to say something yes yes i just wanted to quickly say that that it's it's a worse kind of deceit and that is self-deceit um 
it's different from you trying to encourage yourself. I mean, that you cannot be encouraging yourself, for example, if you have a headache, for example, I think it's, it doesn't make sense to say something like, oh, I'm, I'm really very okay. No, no, you go and look for paracetamol, for example, and take something to deal with the headache. That's what we do, you know. And so if someone has a mental health issue and continues to tell himself or herself that, oh, I'm well, there's nothing wrong with me and all that, that is not being encouraging oneself or being strong in any way. But it keeps making the things to get worse because the, the more you say that you are strong, the worse the situation, you know, comes about. I think we can acknowledge our feelings. We can acknowledge our vulnerabilities. And then we can deal with them. And then we can grow stronger. And then say that we are actually strong when we are stronger as a result of that. It makes a lot more sense. And we are able to connect with the issues that we have and the problem that we have. But the society is also a big problem. And that is why sometimes I sit in the consulting room and someone walks into my consulting room and tells me to my face that my enemy is hearing voices. And um, and my enemy is seeing things that other people are not seeing. My enemy, and then because at first when I first started hearing some of this stuff, I'll be very confused. And then I wait for a moment. I went, person I said, okay, please, who is this enemy? He said, uh, actually, I am experiencing these things. Oh, it's you that is. So you see culture, you see religion, and all that kind of it makes you behave that. But and it's just amazing. And then. By the time that he finished saying that, I said, okay, so you want me to help your enemy? And they, and they would say, yes. I said, okay, do you now see how you've shifted the problem completely away from where it's supposed to be? So I think the culture and especially religion is a real problem and makes people not to access these services as soon as they are supposed to. And I think I would like Howard to talk about this a bit because she, she, she mentioned certain things that are just at the bedrock of being, which is belonging, acceptance, you know, all of these things. In Africa, we're very religious beings. We, we tend to belong to, you know, religion. And in, in itself, it's not a bad thing, of course. But when we start to, you know, compromise our mental health, you know, because of or someone that is a religious leader says, so I was um, the first, you know, series of talks we had in about mental health. We had a psychiatrist there, and we had an imam there and a and a, and a pastor there. And I remember her appealing to them that please, if people come hearing voices, please bring them to the hospital first before you decide to exercise them because some. Sometimes she says that by the time they get to the hospital, whatever intervention that could have happened, you know, would have been, you've made it too late because you've kept this person for so long and so on and so forth. And I think it's very important for us to have this discussion, you know, posed with religion because this is where we belong or we believe that we belong. And that institution tells us sometimes that. If you are having such things, then you don't believe as strongly. You know, sometimes it, you know it, it starts to mess with fundamentals like that. So they say, oh, it's the devil that has got you. And so since the devil has got you, that means that you're not for God. And people are tortured in very many different ways. So I would like how to sort of speak about that, especially in light of those people that are falling and the support groups are here. How many of such have you found, you know, um that you know have found a way different very fantastic question Maren. like truth is i remember getting this question sometime in 2017 where i was asked what what my greatest challenge has been in, in carrying out mental health advocacy and awareness in nigeria and you know the person who asked where i was being interviewed i think they expected that i would say something like oh funding and you know we need this and all of that and I sat down there and I said, religion. And he was like, okay, so let's talk about that. And yes, I mean, of course, there are other challenges, but religion poses a very, very peculiar challenge that perhaps I believe can, you know, it opens up a pathway that could accelerate how we accept mental health um, in, in Nigeria, for example. Religion, I, 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 a lot of times, it's like a hard wiring. And when things are hardwiring, it's like you will protect it at all costs, you know, even if it is doing you a great disservice, even if that ideology in that point in time is causing you to, you know, not interact with the best possible version of yourself or things like that, it's hard. And like rightly said, you know, belonging is such a huge thing. As human beings, we are hardwired for belonging. 
you walk into a place, you want to associate with people like you. You want to identify with the community, with the group. And once we have done that, the truth is we've been conditioned to do that from, from babies, when we're babies, till now. So we cannot just wake up one day and say, oh, you know, I'm just going to dissociate and follow this and follow that. So it's such a broad thing. But then if we're not getting practical, we need to, like you said, like we need to start engaging religious leaders because sometimes you wonder, is it about the text or is it about the practice? But then how many times are we going to keep saying, oh, it's about the practice. Oh, it's not the text. You know, can we just get to having these conversations in, in all of these spaces, including religious spaces? Because yes, indeed, we have had people, I had somebody who called our helpline one time. She was suicidal. Actually, she was about to, you know, carry it out. She was about to take her own life. And, you know, one of the things, you know, we told her at that time was, you know, we're willing to get support. Give us your address. We're going to get you, you know, we'll provide a safe space for you. We will start you on, you know, mental health care and get you like support immediately. And one of the things she said was that, you know, I feel like God would be ashamed of me. Like, I feel like I've disappointed God and this is not how it's supposed to be. I'm a Muslim. She was a Muslim. We've seen it from different religions, you know. So, but this particular lady was a Muslim. She's like, I, I can't, I can't do this because to make it real. And it was so interesting that we would rather give our life than get support just based on our religious, you know, outlook. And it is, like I said, I usually have more questions than answers when it comes to this because it's just so embedded, it's deeply rooted, but more importantly, because it's highly sensitive in our environment. Um, and I think that, you know, especially your example with suicide, you know, Dr. Bill, I think that I'm going to ask you the harder question about, you know, what we're going to do with these religious people. But, you know, one of the things that I, I, I hear you loud and clear is about suicide, because our religious scriptures have very, very clear, clear rules about suicide, right? I mean, you know, you hear, oh, you burn in hell and you didn't give yourself life. But for someone to reach that level of despair, to, you know, because human beings, we are wired to also self-preserve. You won't go to your death, you know, easily. You'll try to, whatever it is, live. And here's somebody telling you they don't want to live. You, you, that should be a huge red flag, you know, for you to realize that that person is not in the right space. So I'm going to talk to Dr. Avity because he's a psychiatrist, and I know that you've had running battles with, you know, the religious, you know, um, people you know in your practice because definitely it comes into your practice as Hawa says it's something that is but I want you to talk about you know how we can partner how we can partner with these people with you know the religious you know um, bodies to be able to at least even if it's not give them training or information or whatever or has, have this dialogue on a professional level because at this point we would also call them professionals because some people would go to them with a mental illness as opposed to come to hospital so how do we partner and how do we get more people better as opposed to leave some some people out exclude them it's um it's really huge um when, when it comes from the perspective of the fact that in most cases, these are the kind of things that is money spinning for the churches. The ideas of the fact that the, you are being spiritually protected by the pastor or by the church. Therefore, there is always a tendency to spiritualize every experience that people have. And in some cases, it, more, it may not even be a problem. Um, I give you a typical example of a lady who has been on medication for um, for two years before I met with her. Incidentally, she didn't have a mental illness, which is which was really very funny. But she was on medication for a mental health issue. I got to see her when there was strike that was going on in the country, and and the reason why that was the case is because she dreamt at the time that she was eating in her dream. And so she got to see her pastor and told her pastor that, see the experience that I had. I dreamt today and I was eating in the dream. And the pastor simply told her that that means that people in your family and your neighbors are planning to kill you. Oh and as a result of what the pastor told her, that people in her family and her neighbors are planning to kill her, this young lady began to stay away from her family, stay away from the family members and so on. But when I sat down with her and I told her that I, I eat in my dream all the time, you know, because I'm trying to lose weight and I love eating ripe, you know, ripe, you know, overripe plantain, fried plantain. 
And my wife is telling me that, no, you know, you can't be eating that. And when she doesn't give it to me, I dream and I eat it in my dream and satisfy myself, you know, that there's no big deal about it, you know. And I took this lady off her medication and just had that conversation with her over a period of, you know, two or three weeks and took her off her medication and she was very okay. I'm just giving you an example of how they can explore and exploit people and possibly lead them down the line to even a mental health issue when they never had any mental health issue as um, um, in that because of you know that their religious beliefs and things of that nature. So the point, the question that he asks is how do we collaborate with them? It's really difficult, but oftentimes what I do is when people come into treatment and I suspect that they may either stop taking their drugs because of their religious belief, because some of them may have to be brought to the hospital, they take drugs and they get well. But when they leave the hospital and go back, they'll be told that if you continue to take your drugs, it's an expression of lack of faith. And as a result of that, God will be immensely angry with you. And so they're likely going to stop their medication in order to be for God to be happy with them. And the problem may return and some of them may commit suicide. You know. So usually what I do is to invite the pastor and then I will have that discussion with the pastor. And then the pastor will tell her in front of me that, no, he can take, you know, she or he can continue to take his drug. He's supposed to be the case. So you see, going to that extent, you know, but you have to do that with every case that you come across. Or you get the person to understand and come to that point where he begins to make that independent decision that he has to continue to take his drugs as a result of this. It's something that is very difficult. Because the pastors themselves want to keep telling people that they have the powers from God to deal with this issue. In fact, sometimes when they get well, the pastors will say something like, they have now cured you physically. Now I will take over and cure you spiritually. You know? <laughs> so they will not have the crowning cap to yes. what they are able to do. So it's a very difficult one, you know. And so, you know, dealing with it from a holistic point of view is very difficult. So. So I, I, I tend to deal with it on a case-to-case -case basis. You know, it makes it easier for me to interact with people at that level. But it's a very difficult one to actually deal with. It's difficult. But you know, is there, um, I'm sure that there's an association that you have with psychiatrists. I mean, is this something that, you know, they would be willing to explore to sort of get, you know, the whole bodies? Because we have can, isn't it? And we have um, the Islamic one as well and so on. Is there a sort of like, can dialogue start on that level to say, look, you know, can we train you? Can we can we raise more awareness? And perhaps there's some psychiatrists that are also leaning towards um, religious, you know, um, practice or religious um, uh, preaching or whatever it is. And perhaps uh, is there room to be able to um, get them on board? Especially, you know, even the the GPs. I think at this point, how do we get more people being aware of this so that a lot more people do not fall on the wayside and not get what treatment that they're supposed to? Good. Now, I've I've also found out that many religious bodies, both from the you know the Christian and Islam are opening up their doors and we are beginning to do a lot of sensitization in these settings where they get to understand that some of the things that they see and they feel that it's a spiritual problem uh, are, are most often times you know mental health issues and the necessity for them to make a referral you know a lot of that is going on at the moment you know in many of these places but we should also remember that there are some that still hold on very strongly to the concept of the fact that, you know, this is actually a spiritual problem. And we see it on television, yes. you know, especially the healing ministries. Yeah, yeah. No matter how much you talk about it, they will never accept it because accepting it means that you are closing the door to where the money trail is going to be coming from. So they'll keep and holding on to that. That's, and that's sadly what it is, you know. Absolutely really, it is. That's sadly it what is. it is. Okay. It is. So now I think the thing that we need to talk about the most that we haven't touched on is, you know, um, government, legislation, the way that we have legislation and we have a Ministry of Health that, you know, presides over our well-being physically, you know, and I know that they also have the purview to be able to, you know, look at our mental health, you know, legislation, how do we have the right legislation? Is government looking in the right direction? Are our education systems, you know, looking at, you know, well-being right from the beginning? And so that this is a practice that keeps going on, you know, um, let's, let's talk about that. Okay. Um... 
legislation. So Nigeria hasn't had a mental health law since 1957, um, which is the Lunacy Act of 1957. And as, it is as ridiculous as it sounds. Um, so over the last two years, um, we've been working with international partners. So at Your Rights Woman, we've been working with international partners at Human Rights Watch and allies of the World Health Organization, um, together with the Federal Ministry of Health in ensuring that, you know, the draft bill that is before the National Assembly is, you know, not just about, oh, Nigeria is passing a mental health bill, yay, but it's really about the content of the bill. And, it, and we've done extensive work about the past two years in dissecting the bill, and it falls short, to put it very simply, um, it falls short of um, international standards, global best practice, and it is not as human rights respecting as it should be based on, you know, some of the treaties and conventions that Nigeria is a state's party to. So a lot of times when we are dealing with, you know, mental health solutions or practices within Nigeria, whether as civil society or, you know, as professionals, we will, we are confronted by systemic and structural hindrances. So whether we, you know, we've, like for example, at Chirai's we've, we've been doing a lot of work, we've directly supported over 3,000 people. Um, you know, with mental health issues and just supporting people with information resources and content and all of that. And we've reached 2 million people, over 2 million people globally. But the thing is when you try to scale that kind of impact in Nigeria, you will be confronted with the fact that first and foremost, we don't have a legislation that mandates that, you know, mental health is at all primary health care level and not just about putting it on a piece of paper, but ensuring that the infrastructure, there is investment in the infrastructure and the human capital to make that possible. Those two things alone, you know, are, are, are non-existent. So when we talk about mental health, really, who are we really talking about? Because the vast majority of the grassroots do not have access. Yes, just, just to jump into what Awa was saying, the, the current bill that is before the National Assembly, we contributed to drafting that particular bill. Um, we were hoping that by now, that bill would have been passed into, into law. But unfortunately, that has not been passed into law. And um, I think I once said something that we should we should not lose sight of, which is it's not just a matter of passing it into law, but a matter of implementing what is in the bill. Let's take for example, there are certain things that we should have been implementing now, which is not being done. The primary health care, um, you know, the bill establishing the primary health care shows very clearly that there are some basic. Um, kind of intervention that should take place at the primary health care level, including mental health. But mental health is not being incorporated into primary health care settings in most of the states of the Federation, even though by law it is supposed to be the case. So the point is, at the end of the day, it's not just about the bill itself being passed into law or having a law in place. It is important, very important, because it lays a template and a framework for some of the interventions that we need to put in place. However, the most important thing would be the political will to ensure that this is implemented at that level. Because without that, yes, we could have a law, but nothing would happen in that's about the law, you know, that there's nothing that the government will really be able to do. And why we really need it is because if the government goes ahead to have a policy and have a law or this mental health law that we're trying to pass, um, you know, is passed, then possibly, you know, other states can draw up their bill. Presently now, it is only Lagos state that has a mental health law that is sensible. The country does not have any mental health law that is sensible. I mean, the mental health law, just as, um, you know, our mentioned, is a lunacy law, you exactly. know, which was really I mean, the name so of it, lunacy, you can only just <laughs> imagine. Yeah. Absolutely, right. even from the name itself. So mm -hmm. it, tells you, it tells you very clearly the yeah, kind of... Already, there's already stigma there, you know? Absolutely, and that's what we're trying to change. I think it's good for you to give us a few last words about uh, mental health, mental wellness, post-COVID, and, um, you know, African response. You know, what is it that we can do as individuals, you know, to make sure that our mental wellness and other people's mental wellness are paramount and they're taken care of? Yeah. Okay. Okay, first of all, I think I think it's very important for us to take care of ourselves, to be able to uh, take care of other people. Um, we may not have the capacity to change the whole world, but each and every one of us has a space in which he can do something. You know, I have listened to Awa, 
and seen how she has grown tremendously in the last four years in terms of outreach, in terms of capacity, in terms of the space that she occupies, and in terms of the impact that she's making. Now, if she was waiting to make the impact of 2020 when she started, maybe she would not have started because it would look so overwhelming. And so each and every one of us should use the opportunity that we have, whatever small space that we have, to do some sort of advocacy, carry out sensitization as much as possible. And if we have the capacity for intervention, we should be involved in this intervention. These little drops, with as many persons as possible, can go a long way to improving the mental health awareness, information that people will need to have, and possibly improving the general health and well-being of the people that are around us. So we can contribute in one way or the other. Your child is in a school, and the school has PTA meeting. If you have an opportunity of talking about something about mental health, why not spend five minutes during the PTA meeting and create a little bit of awareness? The parents may get to understand that and things of that nature. Now, let me quickly tell you something that happened when you know the 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 principal of my child's school when he was very young you know that he was about it was about i think six years or thereabout you know so the principal told me that i want to really see you at at that time and when i walked in she told me that your son is always well behaved very composed and everything but i'm telling you now that he's become very disruptive that is there any problem at home is there anything that is happening at home and i told the uh the principal, that, oh, the mother just had a new baby, and so he's no more the shining star. <laughs> so, so it was easy to understand why all of a sudden, you know, they're not dotting all over him and it's becoming something else, you know. And that was very important for us, you know, that to be able to engage with him and all that. So, we should use every opportunity that we can get to be able to assist in whatever way that we can. So thank you, Dr. MT. So people, advocacy, advocacy, and use whatever platform you have, you know, to help somebody or to let somebody know better. So how we're just wrapping up, you know, and um, I would like you to sort of like give your own last thoughts on how, what, what can we do to make this better? How do we get this message of mental health, you know, across to people, to make them understand, to make them, you know, do better? How can an individual make an impact just like you have done so it, it, it's it's interesting everybody really does have a role to play and um but, but, but it's a balance yeah on the one hand we want everybody to get involved in conversations we want everybody to do their own part but i think it's also important that we need to understand how and when where we begin to unlearn the ideas that we have formed around mental health because what I realized is that when, even when we find that people are, are not misinformed or ignorant around mental health, they are under aware about mental health. So a lot of times we find that there is a gap somewhere. So there is a lot of knowledge that needs to be filled in. We think a lot of people think they know about mental health, so they can talk about mental health. But what tends to happen is that perhaps not in the right way, perhaps not with enough, with enough empathy, perhaps not in the language that is, you know, perhaps more politically correct or more enhancing to the conversation. So I think on an individual level, we need to deliberately and we need to be very intentional about getting new or learning new things about mental health and on learning the things we think we know about mental health or we actually know. And then beyond that, it's like, you know, it's really about everything. You know, you don't need the biggest platform, you know, like Miller said, you don't need the biggest platform. You just really need, you know, to be genuinely um, interested about it. You don't even need big passion because when you talk about passion, people think you're talking about something huge, like, oh, you know, this is what I want to do. It doesn't have to be your thing, your passion project or anything. It's just like you said, it's like, having conversations, creating spaces where people can actually have conversations, whether it's in PTA meetings, whether it's in school, in classrooms, whether it's in your workplaces, you know, whether it's in your home, in your family, you know, lead to conversations. And again, it's not conversations that are generally about mental illness, but it's really just about mental health. It's about the wellness of the people. And that transcends everything. It's integrated into everything. It's in how we eat, how, how we sleep, how we show up. It is how we are able to be vulnerable with ourselves and how we create spaces for people to fully show up with themselves. It's about the power of shame on our well-being. You know, it's all of those little things that we tend to, you know, somewhat overlook. 
And then we realize that those things are actually the things that tend to cause, you know, the, the bigger things in life. So everybody does have a part. Um, ha ha everybody has a role to play. But I think it's first, you know, understanding where you are at in terms of understanding mental health and then doing the little that you can, whether it's in any space that you are, digital and offline as well. At 5 Minutes Madness, only you can understand. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre. Loans in 5 Minutes. Stop you!